So previously, we talked a little bit about the structure of cell membranes and also about the fact that the structure of the cell membrane makes the cell selectively permeable. So it has some control over what is able to cross the cell membrane or the plasma membrane, either from the outside of the cell to the inside or from the inside of the cell to an out, the outside. What I wanna do now um, that we've talked about the structure a little bit and we've talked about the fact that the cell controls what can move is talk a little bit about how those things that are allowed to cross the cell membrane actually go about doing so. So with this first slide, what I wanna do is just identify some terms for you and kind of give you some definitions and then we'll work to hopefully establish a better understanding um, of how these things are actually occurring with transport across the cell as we continue. So the first way that cells can allow something to um, cross its membrane is what's known as passively. So here's kind of an abstract definition of what passively is. It means the substance that crosses the cell membrane is doing so by squeezing between adjacent phospholipids or through a channel, okay? So if we're squeezing between adjacent phospholipids, if you look down here at this picture um, of this phospholipid bilayer, that just means that basically our substance is moving across that cell membrane, just squeezing between adjacent phospholipids. Or last time we talked, we talked about the fact that sometimes you've got proteins that are embedded in here, and some of those proteins can allow substances to move across the cell membrane as well by acting basically as a channel to them. But the thing that's kind of the kicker about passive transport is when something is moving passively, this means that it's moving from an area of its higher concentration to an area of its lower concentration. So that always has to be the case. And the other thing that's unique about passive transport that you should definitely know is when substances are moving passively, it doesn't require energy in the form of ATP. So the other way that substances can move across the cell membrane is what's known as actively. And when you have a substance that's moving actively across the cell membrane, that basically means that substance is being pumped. So it's requiring some energy from the cell to power pumps. And the reason that it has to be pumped is because the substance is moving from an area of its lower concentration to an area of its higher concentration. Another thing that you should definitely know about active transport is that this means that energy is required in order to be able to power those pumps. And this energy that's being used by the cell to power the pumps is energy in the form of ATP. So I wanna talk a little bit more about passive transport and give you some examples, and then we'll look at active transport as well. So here's a couple of things, again, that you should know about passive transport. This one really is kind of a review with some additional extra information. So basically when passive transport is occurring, molecules are moving from an area of their higher concentration to an area of their lower concentration, as I said before. But you should know that another way of saying this is we say a molecule is moving down its concentration gradient. So again, if it's moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, the substance is moving down its concentration gradient. We also talked about the fact with the last slide that when passive transport is occurring, no energy in the form of ATP is required. So this instead happens naturally due to what's known as Brownian movement. And Brownian movement is a type of kinetic energy. So it's a kinetic energy that's inherent to molecules. No energy on the part of the cell is being expended in order to get passive transport to occur. So again, if you look at this picture down here, we've got these beakers. And what this is trying to represent for you is we've taken a sugar cube that you can see here in this first beaker and we have dropped it into the water. And of course, what we've got initially is we've got a really high concentration of sugar molecules that are forming this cube. And what you'll notice happens over time is that these sugar molecules basically start to dissolve away from or they start to break off from that cube and they slowly spread themselves out over time until we reach over here in this last beaker, 
what's known as equilibrium. So equilibrium is a situation where you've got an equal concentration of sugar molecules in every area of the beaker, okay, in every area of the water. And that's different from what we started out with where there was a very high concentration of sugar molecules in the cube and there were no sugar molecules spread out through the rest of the beaker. So if any of you have ever put um, a sugar cube in a beaker of water or a drink or something like that, if you let it sit long enough, you know that it starts to dissolve on its own. You don't really need to stir it. And if you were to wait several days, what you would end up with is a beaker where the sugar cube has completely disappeared, it's dissolved, and those sugar molecules have spread nicely throughout your liquid to establish equilibrium. The reason that happens is, again, because we have this phenomena, which is known as Brownian movement, that's occurring. So Brownian movement is the random movement of molecules. And believe it or not, any time you have molecules, even if they're forming a structure that seems to be a solid like a sugar cube, those molecules are actually moving just kind of randomly within that structure. And as they're moving kind of randomly, they're bouncing into each other. And when they bounce into each other, they bounce off in opposite directions. And that tends to spread the sugar molecules Okay, when they have water to dissolve into, it tends to spread the sugar molecules away from this area where we've got a very high concentration of sugar slowly over time until we end up with this situation where we've actually got equilibrium. One of the things that I mentioned before is that when we have molecules moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, like we see to initiate this passive transport, that we get energy being released, basically. So that's something that we'll talk about later on in class, and just something that you should kind of have in mind now, that as molecules are moving down their concentration gradient, like when they're spreading out during passive transport, we're having energy released from that situation. So we've kind of talked about um, an abstract definition of what passive transport is. We've looked at a little bit what actually causes passive transport to occur. What I want to do with this slide here is give you a couple of examples with some simplified drawings. So each one of these little circles is meant to represent a cell. So here's our first cell over here on the left side of the diagram. Each one of these little pink circles is meant to represent um, an a molecule of carbon dioxide. So when we have an area of higher concentration somewhere, basically what's gonna happen is that we've got these molecules inside of this cell that are moving randomly, and when they crash into another molecule in here, that tends to push them off in the opposite direction, and that tends to cause these molecules, when they're small and they're lipid soluble like carbon dioxide is, to actually move across the cell membrane from an area where they're more highly concentrated to an area where they're less highly concentrated. So that's why I've got these little purple arrows in here. They're indicating that as we've got this higher concentration of carbon dioxide in here, these molecules have collisions with each other, they bounce off in opposite directions, that's gonna tend to push them from this area of higher concentration inside the cell to the area where we've got a lower concentration outside the cell. Now these molecules that are outside the cell, they're also randomly moving as well, but because there are so few of them, they're having far less collisions out here, outside of the cell, that would tend to drive them back into the cell. But again, these molecules out here are moving, they're just not having as many collisions as the ones that are in the really crowded area inside of the cell and so they tend to stay on the outside of the cell. And what would happen over time is we would come to equilibrium. So eventually, if we just let this cell sit here with this carbon dioxide, the collisions that are happening at a higher concentration inside the cell would tend to drive things outside of the cell until we've got an equal concentration outside of the cell. At that point, we are again at what's known as equilibrium.
If you look at this cell over here, so cell two on the right side of your slide, um, you'll notice here's the opposite situation. So we've still got these carbon dioxide molecules um, and we've got a higher concentration in this case of them outside of the cell, a much lower concentration of carbon dioxide molecules inside the cell. So these molecules out here are gonna be randomly moving. They're gonna be crashing into each other. When they have these collisions, they're gonna bounce off of each other in opposite directions. And that's gonna to tend to push these molecules in these higher collision areas into lower collision areas inside of the cell. These molecules inside the cell are also going to be moving randomly, but because there's fewer of them, they're not crashing into each other as often and bouncing to the outside of the cell. So our net movement, as this arrow indicates in this particular diagram, is going to be from outside of the cell to inside of the cell through this passive transport. And in this case, when you've got molecules that are just kind of squeezing between adjacent phospholipids to move from one side of the membrane to another, um, we refer to it as diffusion. So we've talked about passive transport a little bit. I wanna also talk about active transport. So I'll remind you kind of of what the abstract definition of active transport is, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. So if you look at this part of my slide up here, it gives us kind of a definition for what active transport is. Basically, active transport occurs when molecules move across the cell membrane from an area of their lower concentration to an area of their higher concentration. So this is opposite of what would be happening with a passive transport situation. And because it's opposite of what happens in a passive transport situation, we refer to this as the molecules are moving against the concentration gradient. Here's my representation of a cell again. Again, each one of these little pink dots is representing a molecule um, of something that's being transported through active transport. You'll notice we have a much higher concentration of this molecule inside the cell. Outside of the cell, we have a much lower concentration of that molecule. So if you think about what's happening here, active transport, these arrows indicate that we've got this net movement of molecules inside of the cell. So it's against the concentration gradient. It's against what would happen naturally due to Brownian movement. And that's what's happening in active transport. Because it's against the concentration gradient, because it's against what would happen naturally, there's not a lot of force that would push these guys out here that are so spread out from each other into the cell. What the cell has to have is little pumps that are embedded in its cell membrane that bind to these molecules that are out here and use energy in the form of ATP to take that molecule and pump it across the cell membrane so that we are getting movement um, of this molecule from an area of its lower concentration into an area of its higher concentration. So that's why ATP is needed with active transport because it's needed to run those pumps that are moving these molecules from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. And then of course, at the same time, because we've got an area of higher concentration inside the cell, these little molecules that are in here are going to be bumping into each other. When they bump into each other, they're gonna bounce off in opposite directions, which is gonna to tend to push them right back out. So we need these pumps kind of running all the time, picking up these molecules that have made their way out and pushing them using ATP back into the cell so that we can have a difference in concentration on the two sides of the membrane. If you're wondering why would we use so much energy to do that, here's a couple of reasons why. Um, when we get into skeletal muscle contraction, later on in chapter eight, one of the things that we're gonna talk about is the fact that skeletal muscle cells have to have a difference in concentration of sodium ions and potassium ions on the two sides of their membrane in order for them to be able to contract. The same is true with nerve cells. They need to have a higher concentration of sodium outside of their cells and a higher concentration of potassium inside of the cells 
in order to be able to send electrical signals. So there are situations, many situations in fact, where active transport is happening in the body in order to set up situations that we need to cause muscles to contract, to cause nerves to be able to send electrical signals, and to do all of the other functions that our body needs to be able to do.